We cannot answer the question of suffering without the full truth of Christianity. And the full truth of Christianity is that we are called to an eternal life, not just this finite life. We are called to the unconditional love and unconditional joy of being with the Trinity in full love with every other person in the communion of saints in a symphony of love. We are called to this as our ultimate destiny. And all we have to do is make the choice to get our narcissistic egos out of the way. Hard for me to do, but this is the challenge. This is what we have to do. But of course, we need to tell our kids, hey, there's no ultimate tragedy and suffering on this earth. Even the grief of losing a child, profound and horrible as that might be, even to contemplate, that is already being taken care of by God. God is already pulling that child to himself and to perfect joy. God is already taking care of, of providentially of the person if they are receptive to his providential care at the very moment the suffering occurs. God is already making good come out. The Holy Spirit is already opening doors where closed doors exist. But what we have to do is we have to make sure that we can get our kids onto this plane, that they can see this fuller reality and then learn how, <clears throat> how to suffer well. Basically, we have kind of a five-part program in order to do this. I'm just going to very briefly go through them. Number one, we go through those four levels of happiness that many of you have heard me talk about before. Secondly, we try to get the kids on a transcendent plane. We give them evidence that they have a soul. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Thirdly, once we can kind of establish to them that they have a soul that's immortal, once they see the fourth level of happiness and the third level of happiness, that's where you know, true peace and, and true joy and true love are going uh, to occur, where real meaning in life is going to occur, instead of the emptiness that we just heard John Garvey talking about and, and uh, uh, Catherine uh, Jean Lopez talking about. So the key thing then is we need to get them to that point where they can see what life is really about. Then we need to give them a definition of God that Jesus gave. Who is God? We have to get them up to the level of the father of the prodigal son. So that's our third step, is to get them there. Number four, let's confront the myth right now. So in the fourth step, they're, they're prepared. They're ready to go. And what's the, the, the step? The step is to say, okay, why would God allow suffering? Why would he allow suffering caused by human beings? Why would he allow suffering caused by nature, the blind forces of nature? It just doesn't seem a lo that an all-loving God would do that. And we're going to talk about the quick response to that. But there's also, of course, a, a much more a prolonged and, and profound response as well. And finally, fifth step, we need to teach them how to suffer well. In light of their faith, in light of all the steps that we've gone through, how do they bring prayer into their suffering? How do they bring natural virtue like courage and temperance into their suffering? And finally, how do they best follow the Holy Spirit in times of their suffering? These are the things that I think will help our kids. We can profoundly confront the myth. It does take about six, seven, eight class days. And the more time people and teachers take on it, the more profound the explanation can be. But it'll be life-changing for these kids if they can get, not just for the kids. We can bring it into the parishes. It's life-changing for people in the parishes. I give these talks in parishes. People just swarm, uh, you know, uh, over the resources at the end of the talk. So, I mean, the, the key thought is, is, is very clear. Okay, so let's get to it. Uh, first thing, four levels of happiness. I'm not going to go through all four levels with you right now. What I want to do, though, is give you the big existential crisis that occurs right at the nexus between level one and level two on the one hand and level three and level four on the other hand. So uh, this is the big crisis because, of course, level one and level two are the kind of happiness that come first level one from material uh, goods, right? So I accumulate material goods. I have all kinds of material satisfaction and from pleasure. 
So, of course, Bob Spitzer sees the bowl of linguine, lunges it down, and goes, yum. He's happy. So all these things make a guy happy. So we, let's call that level one happiness. And level two happiness is ego comparative satisfaction. That's the kind of happiness that comes when you're basically better than somebody else, have comparative advantage over somebody else, or getting a lot of ego highs all today. It's the kind of thing where you, you basically know, right? You know, I am smarter than you. Thank you very much. You know, I mean, I am a, uh, you know, I'm a, I have more status than you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, and, and I just want you to know that I know, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so forth and so on. But I mean, there's a great deal of happiness that comes from such things. And, and of course, let's just call them ego comparative satisfactions. But of course, we can see almost automatically what begins to happen, especially to the 15 and 16-year-old. Who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who's got more power? Who's got less power? Who's more intelligent? Who's less intelligent? Who's got more status? Who's got less status? Who's more popular? Who's less popular? Who's winning and who's a proverbial loser? Said with complete disdain and voice. I don't have to tell you that if this becomes the only way of being happy for a 15, 16, for a 30, 40 year old, if this is the only thing that defines happiness, material and, and pleasure satisfactions and ego comparative satisfactions, I mean, these things are not bad in themselves, right? Achievement, of course, is good. Credibility only comes from status. So you gotta have some status, right? You gotta have some material well-being. I mean, that's obvious, you know, it's, it's good because if you don't have any security otherwise. You want, you know, not to cower at every com competitor that comes along. So you gotta have some experience of winning. You gotta have some self-esteem. So level one and level two aren't bad. They're just terrible when they become ends in themselves. They're terrible when they become the only objective that will make my life worth living. 70% of our kids will default to level one, level two happiness as the only thing that will make them happy because they are utterly ignorant of level three and level four. <clears throat> Nobody ever gave them the menu. So for all intents and purposes, we got to stop it. And we got to get the kids to choose level three and level four. As many of you already suspect, level three is a contributive kind of happiness. This is the kind of happiness that comes from making a difference to somebody or something beyond myself. I want to make a positive difference to my family. I want to make a positive difference to my friends. I want the world to be better off for my having lived. Nay, I want the world to be optimally better off for my having lived. You get hooked on it. You want your family to be optimally better off for your having lived. Your friends to be optimally better off. Your organization and institutions that you serve to be optimally better. You want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a legacy. I mean, here you all are. I mean, why are you here? I mean, you're already level three and level four people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be bothering listening to a bloviator like me on a perfectly good Saturday after, uh, morning. The key thing, of course, though, is, yeah, you're there. But a lot, of, a lot of people in our culture, they're not there. They have no idea that they could leave an optimal, make an optimal positive difference and leave an optimal legacy in their communities, to their church, to the kingdom of God. They could make an eternal difference. They could make a difference to the culture. They could make a difference to the society. They're oblivious to it. And I don't have to tell you what level four is because level four is clearly we are transcendent beings, and that's what we have to establish to the kids, that we're transcendent beings. We desire not only perfect and unconditional truth and love and goodness and beauty and being, as John Garvey was intimating uh, earlier on, but in addition to all of that, we really, we really desire God himself. We really desire to be in communion with God. Our hearts are restless, said Augustine, until they rest in thee as he addressed God. Yes, that is true. And we can never be satisfied. Never can we get out of a state of restlessness without being in communion with God because God is the only objective that we truly desire. Perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being is God himself. Now, What's our problem? How do we get the kids to choose to go to the contributive, away from the ego comparative, especially when they're a winner? How do we get them to choose to go to the transcendent, especially when they come from material means? 
How do we do it? By giving them the one thought they had never figured on. And that is that when you make material satisfaction and ego comparative satisfactions, level one and level two, when you make that the sole objective of your life, get ready, everyone, because this is what you can expect. You can expect jealousy, because anybody who's got a, dealt a better hand than you, you're going to want to find a way of you know, dealing with those people. You know, put them down a little anyway. I mean, the point is, inferiority. You can expect inferiority if you're on the losing side. You can expect superiority with all of its beneficial gifts, like contempt of other beautiful, good human beings made in the image and likeness of God. Yes, you can feel contempt. I'm so sorry that you haven't accomplished nearly as much as I have with your life. But I guess you can live with yourself, so it's okay, you know. And, and but that's, that's okay, you know. So, I mean, we literally demean and contempt another human being. And we're surprised to find that these human beings that we have demeaned do not want to give us adulation and tell us <clears throat> every day how far superior <clears throat> we are to them. In fact, they're poised for flight. As Augustine says, the contemptuous person is the loneliest. I can put in the rest of the phrase, only their mothers can stand to be around them. <laughs> the point of, I'm just, just kidding. I know mothers loves her, is unconditional. But the key thing, to, to say is this is not a life, you know, I mean, even the winners are going to get taxed, right? Because you're constantly facing fear of loss of esteem, you know, just a knockdown in public. You're t just killed by ego sensitivities. I mean, you know, you mispronounce the word spectroscopy in public three times, and somebody walks up, Spencer, that word spectroscopy, it's spe you pronounce it spectroscopy, and now everybody thinks you're an idiot, and then you go home and you play the tape a hundred times over, and then have suicidal feelings? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. Of course, all these things happen. I've been there, done that. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get to, though, is Kids know when you tell them what's really going on and why they're miserable, <clears throat> why the self-pity and why the loneliness and why the ego rage and why the jealousy and why the inferiority and why the superiority and everything else that makes life so happy. When you tell them what the source is, click level three and level four, the contributive, the legacy the transcendent, their true selves. The light turns on and they choose it. I swear they choose it. And when they do choose it for themselves, that's part one of the suffering mystery because you need to convert the heart before the mind. It's not going to work if you give a rational argument, as I will give in our fourth step, if you don't have their hearts in the trim. It will not work. So we need to get them up to level three and level four by their own choice. And the vast majority of them do that. A 70% default rate to level one and level two now turns into an additional 40% coming onto our plane, level three and level four. And that makes all the difference. But let's get to that fourth plane, that level four, that transcendent domain, so that the kids know, hey, Nothing's going to end here. This is merely a transitory life. It's all going to be redeemed in God's eternity in unconditional love and joy according to the promise of Jesus Christ. Did you know you have an eternal soul? And if you do, that's what you ought to be living for and not just your baser self. And the kids will always say, give me some proof. Well, we give four kinds of proof. We talk about the natural propensity toward transcendence, spirituality, the sacred, and religious. I'm not going to do that mercifully for you today, but it's in the curriculum. Number two, we talk about those five transcendent desires, and we use Plato's argument and Aquinas' argument to show that the only source of the desire for perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being, the only source could be perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, and being itself. And if that's the case, 
then God is present to each one of us in our consciousness, in our creativity, in our thinking, in our emotion, in everything that we are, completely transforming us out of the domain of the animals. You know Bernard Lonergan's great phrase, when animals run out of biological opportunities and dangers, that's instinctual opportunities, physical instinctual biological opportunity. So you stop petting the dog, stop all the biological opportunity of affection, stop feeding the dog, that's a biological opportunity of, of, of food. You know, stop threatening the dog, so biological danger. You just stop all the biological opportunities and danger. You know what the dog, the most sophisticated dog will do? It will fall out of its state of conation into a state of slumber and fall asleep. Human beings do not do anything of the kind. They want more truth, and they're insatiably curious. They want more love, and they're insatiably looking for love. They want more goodness and justice, and they'll insatiably search for it and think about it and create for it. And of course, you start describing it, and the kids go, yeah, that's sort of like me. Do I want more beauty every single day? I say, why do I turn up the music to 1,000 decibels? Because I want it to be more beautiful. <laughs> they know. They know. All of a sudden, when you present them with, hey, I bet those desires are unconditional, that you want perfect truth, love, God. and where did you get the awareness sufficient to desire perfect and unconditional truth, love, goodness, beauty, and being? Where did you ever get that? By looking out into the world and seeing some beauty? How could that give you the awareness of perfect beauty so that every single solitary manifestation of beauty you see in the world is not good enough? I can improve on it. I can tweak this, maybe. Where did you get that capacity, that awareness? God present to you. When you make the argument, and I make it much more prolonged argument, but the key thing is the kids get it. And they begin to have this slight glimmer. Well, maybe I am transcendent. And then we nail them with the near-death experiences. We only do near-death experiences from the vantage point of peer-reviewed medical journals. So like in The Lancet, which is the, 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 the big uh, uh, medical journal in, in, in uh, England, or the JAMA, the, the Journal of the American Medical Associations, Diseases for Children, or whatever it is. So it has to be a peer-reviewed medical journal. It has to be a longitudinal study that lasts for many years. It has to be done over a course of many patients, many hospitals, ranging from 50 to 1,000 patients in the study, et cetera, et cetera. It has to have control groups, et cetera. Clinical death is very well-defined, flat EEG, right? No electrical activity in the cerebral cortex, manifested also by fixed and dilated pupils and um, no gag reflex, which indicates in the lower brain little uh, sputtering electrical activity. For all intents and purposes, the brain is shut down dead and taken from me as a guy interested in physics. No electricity, no voltage, no organic and physical activity. Dedo dedere. What's my point? <laughs> My point simply is this. During these manifestations, and we tell the kids this, right? We just go through and say, hey, during these manifestations, uh, a soul literally leaves the body. In 25% of the cases, people undergoing clinical death, 25 experience, uh, what's called a near-death experience. So 25%, 75% um, do not. We don't know why. You know, I can't read God's mind yet. I don't know why. But, but uh, the fact is 25% do, and it's worth studying those 25% because they're hovering over their bodies and they're able to see a lot of things going on in the operating room and outside the operating room. And the kids are all kind of, no, you're kidding me. No, and I, I say, here, let's just take a look at some of the veridical evidence. Veridical evidence is something very unusual. So it, it, it can't be just something typical that happens during a resuscitation procedure Right, so uh, you know a, a machine, or uh, you, you know that that's very commonly used, or the paddles which are commonly used during research can't be anything like that. It has to be something truly unusual that the patient saw and can be subsequently verified with great accuracy. So essentially, um, for example, the guy will say, "Well, you know, when I went outside of my body, I I went, you know, I just kind of zoomed out uh, the hospital walls there on the fifth floor." 
And I was kind of hovering outside the fifth floor of the hospital, and I saw this sneaker on the ledge out there. Looked like it had been out there for 20 years. One of Dr. Melvin Morse's researchers at the University of Washington crawled out onto the ledge of that hospital, and there it was. How did he know? I'm going to ask him. You know, this is tough to answer. I mean, oh, Mr. So-and-so, we lost your dentures. Oh, you really didn't. Uh, actually, I saw the nurse when I was getting resuscitated. She yanked the dentures out of my mouth and she threw it on this table, but it slid under a machine that looks just like this. So if you go down to the OR and you look at all those machines that look just like this, you'll find my dentures. There they are. Yeah, here you go, Mr. So-and-so. Here's your dentures back. You know, I, you know, when I was dead, you know, I went into the room ne waiting room next door. And uh, my brother was there in my T-shirt insulting me. Never speak badly of the dead. And I keep being a car says, <clears throat> And he, the words, he knew the exact words of the insult. That's the best part. And, of course, we're able to recount it. Dr. Janice Holden actually did a, then a comparative study of all of the veridical evidence of or 37 major studies in peer-reviewed journals took all these things, she eliminated all the, um, uh, the uh, data that was not veridical, not unusual enough. So 55% of the data was too commonplace, you know, the machine, the paddles, whatever. So the remaining 45%, get this, 37% of those people, 37% reported veridical, unusual data 100% accurately using the strictest criteria, only 8% had slight inaccuracies, though generally correct in what they were describing. How do you explain that? Kids are kind of looking. Number two, Kenneth Ring did a study of near-death experiences of the blind and discovered in his study that 80% of blind people regain their sight. And most of these people were blind from birth. So most of them, for the very first time in their lives, during their near-death experience, so they're floating out of their bodies, and for the first time in their lives, they're seeing down below, and they're going, ha, huh, I've never seen colors before. But the best part is, they not only can, for the first time, with great hardship, describe color and shape and try to describe it in terms of, because they've never had any words for it, right? They really didn't know what red was, but they could tell you it's a brighter color than this one over here. I, I could tell you it looked beautiful, so forth and so on. And, of course, they describe these things, including veridical, unusual data, 80%. Now, how do you explain that? And then when they come back into their bodies... They're blind again. I got to tell you, it's hard to explain. Number three, uh, Dr. Melvin Morse over at the University of Washington Medical S uh, School did a huge study, had a, a kind of a modified polygraph machine to measure people's, uh, you know, responses to death anxiety. And, and of course, you know, the, he'd... Uh, uh, measure these little kids. So, he, you know, he wanted uh, patients without an agenda, and kids are great that way. And so, of course, he gets right out there. He, he's measuring this. Almost 100% of the kids who experienced clinical death, that's 25% of them, I mean, 25% of the total sample, right, had a near-death experience. Almost 100% of them actually had almost no death anxiety as measured by his modified polygraph. Of all the other 75%, Almost 100% of them who did not have a near-death experience, they, their death anxiety was higher than the norm. How do you explain this? It's just really difficult unless there's some intervening experience that is so profound it affects the entire psyche. You can't fool the... Po well, maybe you can. Okay, but not all the time. Fourth... You go over to the other side, and when you get over to the other side, you typically see either deceased relatives, or you see Jesus, or you see a loving white light, or all three, or two out of three. The key thing, of course, is when you get over to the other side, the little kids see Jesus, and even kids who are not Christians will come over, and they'll come back, and they'll say, you know, I saw Jesus. And the researcher will say, well, how did you know it was Jesus if, uh, if you're not a Christian? Well, he told me. 
Just that simple. <laughs> Completely without agenda. But the more interesting thing is the relatives, the deceased relatives. You know, so the kid goes over to the other side and meets Aunt, you know, Iris, who the kid never heard of before. Comes back and says to his mom, you know, hey, mom, I met Aunt Iris. How'd you know Aunt Iris? I mean, she died 20 years before you were born. And then the kid says, oh, she told me it was her. And she says, well, how did you really know? Oh, she told me the, the, the secret name of your teddy bear, Cuddle Squared or whatever. That, that would have been my teddy bear. <laughs> but, but the key thing, of course, is, you know, uh, the mother is in a state of shock because she never revealed this to anybody it was the secret name, etc. What I'm trying to say is, the evidence today for near-death experience is not only convincing to adults who really sit down and study it, not just convincing for the doctors, uh, you know, like uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who recently wrote that book, Proof of Heaven, and so forth, um, you know, Harvard Fellow, but it's very convincing to the kids. But my point is simply this. They start believing oh my gosh, I, I probably have a soul that's going to survive death and is going to meet the loving white light and deceased relative. Holy smokes, maybe there is something to this Christian message. And then boom, we just load right on them the new evidence for the resurrection from N.T. Wright and John P. Meyer. We just put right on there because, of course, we want to show that the, the, the connection between the near-death experiences and Jesus' revelation through his own resurrection we want to show them what the real Christian connection is and that Jesus is the way. Now, I'm sorry? Oh, my gosh. All right. Uh, let me just, I'm not going to be able to get to uh, who is God. What I want to get to, though, is I want to get to why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow suffering? You have to split the question into two parts. The first part is, why would an all-powerful, all-loving God allow human beings to cause suffering to other human beings? In a nutshell, here is the answer. Because God needs to create us free to choose unlove, to choose non-loving things in order that our love might be our own. Our love cannot initiate from us if we do not have the choice not to be loving, if we do not have the choice not to be loving, then all we are are robots. All we are are programmed robots, programmed by the great marionette here in the sky who literally has given us all the properties to display loving behaviors toward one another for which we have no choice. But that's not love. And that's not being made in the image and likeness of God with the dignity of God himself. The only way God can give us the ultimate dignity of who he is is to allow us to choose the possibility of unlove. He doesn't create the actuality of suffering. He creates the possibility of suffering by creating the possibility of unlove because he has no other choice if he wants to create creatures like himself. Pertains to us, pertains to the angels. The kids get it. But then there is the question about why would God allow nature to do that? The blind forces of nature. Okay, Spitzer, so it is correct that God would not allow, uh, that God would allow suffering for the sake of love. But why, why would God allow nature to cause suffering? Terrible suffering, grievous suffering, volcanoes and earthquakes and floods and famines and disease. Why? Why would he do it? And the answer in brief is this. Because God wanted to create an imperfect world. He did. He didn't want to create for us a perfect little pleasure bubble that we could be in. Where he, as hovering God parent, could be over us at all times, preventing any kind of pain from happening to us. He literally wanted to create us in an imperfect world. When my father first told me this, I thought, are you kidding me? This sounds very suspicious to me. And my dad said, there are far worse things than suffering out there. He told a parable, which I don't have time for today. But what he wanted to tell me is, son, just think for a moment. If there were no fear, 
If there were no fear because there was no possibility of pain, no possibility of embarrassment, no possibility of mortification, no possibility of death, if there were no fear, do you realize you would never know whether you had any courage or not? That you would never know that you had metal, that you chose something, a great sacrifice to yourself because you wanted to defend an ideal or defend a person you loved, that you just, you wouldn't ever know this? You think that not knowing, not being able to choose courage is better than not suffering? And then he goes on. He says, you know, everything has a cost. I mean, if we're ever going to display self-sacrificial love, then, of course, we're going to have to pay the cost. Sacrifice means there's a cost to it. I mean, my father just saying to me, do you realize that if there was no suffering, possibility of suffering in the world, if God created you in a perfect world, do you realize that you would never be able to sacrifice for anybody? You'd never know that about yourself. You don't have to do it for an eternity. All you have to do is keep choosing it a few times in this world so that you know who you are. You define yourself. But isn't it nice to know that you're capable of making self-sacrifice for somebody beyond yourself, for an ideal beyond yourself, for a faith beyond yourself, that you are capable of high-mindedness and to pay the cost for it? that you're capable of self-sacrificial, wouldn't you want to know? Or would you just want to be in your little pleasure bubble? I began to think, well, maybe the pleasure bubble isn't that good. But the key thing, of course, (laughs) so he goes on and he says, do you realize that if God created you in a perfect world, there'd be nothing for you to do? Absolutely nothing for you to do. You couldn't improve the world. You couldn't operate for the common good. You'd have no self-definition of having done anything for anybody because God, the hovering parent, went out and did it for you. He made sure that there would be no reason to get together as a human community into common cause. As we are all here oriented around common cause, there'd be no reason for it whatsoever because God would have done it all and done it better than us. And of course, he keeps going. And God also allowed us to build the kingdom of God. He allowed us to have a place to actually do something for the kingdom of God because he didn't do it all. We can build the church. Why are we here? We can build the, uh, the hope and light in the world because there is something for us to do. God left some space for us to do these things. And finally, of course, gets down to, my father says, that wonderful gift of humility. Remember St. Paul in 2 Corinthians Chapter 12, and he says, you know, the Lord gave me a thorn in the flesh, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from getting proud. And of course, St. Paul recognized something really important, that there was something far, far, far worse than suffering. Something, but that's a, 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 the thorn in the flesh is some physical ailment. Maybe his eyes, possibly, you know, well, who knows. But the key thing is, is, he's got this thorn in the flesh, it's it's impeding him, it's causing him pain, something's going on, an angel of Satan is beating him, why? Because he says to keep me from getting proud, and he recognizes there's something far worse than suffering, and that's narcissism, and that's arrogance, and that's pride, that's all of the ego sensitivities, and all of the ego manifestations that literally blur the vision of love and the vision of joy that is ours in unconditional love and joy in heaven. And he knows this. And he says, oh my gosh, I don't want to give up real love to be a narcissist. I don't want to be born you know, without the possibility of knowing. I, I'll take the suffering because the narcissism is far, far worse than that. At the end of the day, the key thing is, my father said, there are far worse things than suffering. And that far worse thing is not to know courage, not to know self-sacrificial love, not to ever have humility as a possibility over against narcissism and egocentricity, not to be able to do anything to build up the world or make it a better place, to enter into community for common cause, to do something noble and to do something great. There's no possibility of nobility for the church, no possibility of nobility for the world. Arg! A perfect world 
is definitely overestimated if you are being given an eternal life. The kids get it. My last minute, I'll just simply say this. We can give the kids a formula complete with spontaneous prayers and the natural virtues that they're going to need to suffer well. They have to realize that God does not want to cause suffering. And he doesn't want to cause suffering. He is with us in compassion during our suffering. But like any other parent, he has to let us go. He has to let us make decisions. He has to let us define ourselves. He has to let us go from level one and level two to level three and level four through our own choice and decision. He has to let us define our existence because if we do it imperfectly for just a short time on this earth, enough to show the manifestation, the direction that we want to go, God can take care of the rest. Believe me, he's going to have to do it for me because I'm not going to be perfect at the end of this life. And if he takes that, per- that little decision, that little sense of decision, my imperfect life, and he can transform it into the fullness of his unconditional love, that's forever, and it's worth the suffering. And then we teach them how to use the Holy Spirit Because the Holy Spirit does involve. Once that door slams, I tell you, the Holy Spirit is opening up another door. And when the Holy Spirit opens up another door, it's going to be sometimes very unusual, almost unexpected. You won't even know where it came from. And you'll go, as I did at one point, a door was slamming, and I was kind of looking at something else. And finally, you know, know, as I was uh, examining all kinds of different things that were going on in my life in college, it suddenly occurred to me that the one thing I really did like was um, religion. One thing I really did like was, you know, philosophy. And I, I'd come to this over a long period of time. And, and of course, um, uh, I finally followed the impetus because of a great spiritual director, Gerard Steckler. And, and I just have to tell you, this makes all the difference in the world. But you have to see the opportunity when the door opens. And you have to step into it. You need to test the spirits, right? Remember the old trick of discernment. If you're increasing in trust in God, hope in your salvation and love, That new opportunity, that door opening, has to be the Holy Spirit because the devil would never open that door to you. Alternatively, if you see your trust decreasing, trust in God decreasing, your hope and salvation decreasing, your love decreasing, you know that can't be the Holy Spirit. That's got to be the enemy of your human nature, the evil one himself. The key thing is, if you look for the open doors, the Spirit will present it. When the Spirit opens the door, you'll feel a sense of fascination. You'll feel a sense of energy and a sense of desire. Go through it. After about two months, test the Spirit. Make sure you're increasing in trust and hope and love. And if you do, ask the people around you. And if so, follow the open door till its conclusion. Look at what happened to me. The key thing, of course, is for all intents and purposes, this is our method. Thank you very, very much.